May grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, the Father, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Word of God, which is the basis of the sermon this morning, is a portion of the epistle lesson read earlier. I recall your attention to the book of 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verses 1 and 2, where we read as follows that portion of God's Word, which will be the sermon text. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So far the text. In the name of Jesus, who is the Lamb of Calvary, the sacrificial Lamb of God, crucified upon the cross to take away the sin of the world. Dear Christian friends and fellow sinners, creatures of the one true, only living, creating, and preserving triune God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Maybe the most famous verse of the Bible. It talks about believing. You believe. You could say it another way, if you have faith. You're saved by faith in Jesus, God the Son. But how do you come to this faith? The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In other words, you can't have faith without God's word. Hearing God's word. Your faith comes from that word of God, hearing it. Ah, but is hearing it enough? No. Just hearing the word of God isn't enough. The Bible says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Doers of the word. It must be acted upon. It must be lived. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day, not just one hour on Sunday morning. Be ye doers of the word of God. It's called repentance. This is the season of Lent. And hearing the word of God and doing it is called repentance in the Bible. That's the theme for this season. We think about our sins and we repent of them if we are to be doers of the word, not just hearers. There was a young minister, he had just graduated from the seminary. Oh, he was full of zeal. He thought, I'm going to go out and I'm going to really be a good pastor, a really good minister of God. And he was assigned his first Congregation. He got the call from this congregation, and he accepted the call, and he went and became their pastor. And he just jumped right into it with all kinds of uh, feeling and, and hard work. He just did everything he could. He was installed one Sunday, and he went to work Sunday night, that very night, calling on members of his congregation, going to their home. He'd set appointments with them, and he'd go and he'd meet with them and talk to them. And he set meetings for the church. He wanted the, the, the voters' assembly to meet immediately. He wanted the board of elders to meet. He wanted the board of deacons to meet. He called all these meetings. He went to the choir practice that week. 
He did everything he could, and he observed his congregation. He talked to the people, and he found out most of them were not repentant. He'd go to their homes and he'd talk to them about the Bible, about God's Word, and they, they'd argue with him. They'd say, well, we don't, we don't think you're interpreting that right, or we don't, we don't really believe that. We think you're wrong. And he noticed that half the choir didn't come to choir practice that way. And most of the elders didn't come to the elders' meeting. Most of the deacons didn't come to the deacons' meeting. Well, he was discouraged. But he said, I know what I need to do. I need to preach repentance to these people. So my first sermon next Sunday will be, Except ye repent. Quoting Jesus. So he got up into the pulpit on that Sunday and he preached repentance. Except ye repent, ye will all likewise perish. As Jesus said. And he thought, that ought to do it. And so he jumped in Sunday night and he started visiting the people and talking to them. And he called more meetings that week. He thought, surely now they're going to show some repentance. They've heard the word of God. Now they're going to do it. Not be hearers only. So he went to some homes of the members and he talked to them. And one of them actually threw him out of their house. So we don't want to talk about those things. And there was no more attendance at choir practice. There was no change. No change. So next Sunday, he got up and preached, Except ye repent. Same sermon. He says, they just need to hear it again. And he went back out that night and all through the week and called upon his members and went to these meetings and no change. Next Sunday, he said, oh, I've got to preach it again. So he preaches the same sermon, except he repent. But there was no change. Offerings hadn't gotten any greater. They weren't bringing visitors to worship, to hear the word of God. They weren't spreading the word of God themselves in the community and talking to their friends and relatives. And there was no change. There was no repentance. Well, this went on for four Sundays. He, he preached the same exact sermon the first four Sundays. Now, he hadn't planned this. He planned a whole series of sermons on all the different doctrines. But he didn't go on to the second sermon. He kept preaching that first one, except he repent. Well, after the fourth Sunday, the president of the congregation came to him privately and said, you know, Pastor, you know, that's a pretty good sermon, but don't you have any others? And the pastor said, well, the congregation hasn't done what the first sermon was about. I can't go on to the second sermon. I know, except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. Except you acknowledge your sin, where you're going contrary to the Bible, and you're not living the Bible. And I've observed this in my members, and there's no change. I'm going to keep preaching the same sermon for your own good. Because except ye repent... You have no faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Repentance and faith in Jesus go together. Be not just hearers of the word, but doers also. Repentance, knowing your sin, hating your sin, turning from your sin, that, that's part of faith in Jesus. That the Bible verse talks about, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. It's that belief in the only begotten Son of God that He came down from heaven and became the man for you. The man Jesus lived a sinless life but became sin, became your sin, took upon Himself all of your sins, took them to the cross and died 
to pay the full price of your sins for you, paid hell in your place, was forsaken of God in your place as your substitute, your sinless, spotless lamb sacrificed on the altar of the cross and is your only hope for eternal life, is your only Savior. And in Him alone you are righteous before God and sinless and holy before God, fit for heaven. That belief goes along with repentance of sin. But I don't see repentance in, your, in, in this congregation yet, so I'll keep preaching repentance. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And that's what our text this morning means when it, it says, Receive not the grace of God in vain. Just receiving the grace of God isn't enough. Just hearing it, hearing about Jesus, hearing about how he is God who came and died for your sins and is the only door to heaven, just hearing that receiving that into your ears, you can do that in vain, to no profit, if you don't repent of your sins. Confess and turn from your disobedience to God's commandments. The Bible says he died for all but only those who truly repent and believe in him does it profit and they do not receive it in vain the grace of God well when are we to do this when are we to repent when are we to believe the text goes on to tell us now now is the accepted time now is the day of salvation. The Bible says, today, when you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Before you die. Before this tent that we call the body returns to the dust, as we read in Genesis 3. Or before Jesus Christ returns, which he says he will do visibly at the end of the world. Either of which could happen at any moment. It could come at any time. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. But so many people put it off. Put it off. Let's, let's just... Go through the, a lifespan of a human being. You're born an infant. You're born a baby. For infants, for newborn babies, behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Did you know that? Bring those newborn babies to baptism. That's the only means that God promises that the Holy Ghost will work faith in their soul through baptism. Jesus said, go into all the world and baptize all nations. That means all people, all ages. But yet so many parents put it off. For them, for their baby, today is not the accepted time. Today is not the day of salvation. Let's put it off till, oh, years later. There's even some churches that teach them to do that. Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. He rebuked his apostles when they said to the parents, Ah, don't bring your babies to Jesus. Jesus was much displeased at that. Even for babies, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Babies too need to be brought to Jesus, their Savior and Lord. For they too are sinners. 
The wages of sin is death. Do babies die? Yes. So therefore, they're sinners. Just like their parents. And their, their first parents, Adam and Eve. They inherited that. So, the baby grows up and becomes a toddler. A preschooler. Do preschoolers need Jesus? Do they need to repent and believe in Jesus? Most people think not. Oh, no. They're just little children. They don't need Sunday school. They don't need their mother and father to, to teach them the Bible at home. They're too little for that. All they can do right now is have fun. It's not the day of salvation for them, they say. We'll put it off until they get into school. Well, they get into school. We get into the school years. Grade school, middle school, high school, whatever. And now the attitude is, well, you're only young once. Now's the time to live it up. Now's the time for sports. Now's the time for this and that and the other thing. You don't have time for repentance and the Bible and God and Jesus and all that stuff. We'll worry about God later on. Right now, have fun. Get into dating. You got your schoolwork. When I'm out of school, then I'll start thinking about maybe the Bible and God and repentance. For all too many school children, now is not the accepted time. Now is not day of salvation. Well, then we go to college, maybe. Some people go to college. You know what happens in college? You get smart. Too smart for God. Too smart for the Bible. Too smart for Jesus. Too smart to think about sin and repentance. A poll was taken recently of college age people they were asked, uh, are you open-minded? And almost all of them said, yeah, I'm open-minded. And they said, are you open-minded about science fiction? All these things you see in you know, science fiction movies and so forth. Oh, yeah, many of them said, yeah, we're open-minded about that. We think that could happen. They were asked, uh, are you open-minded about Men from outer space, UFOs. And most of them said, yeah, we're open-minded about that. We think there could be life on other planets. And they were asked, well, you, are you open-minded about the occult? You know, uh, witchcraft and Ouija boards and chain letters and all that kind of stuff. You think there's some truth to that? And many of them said, yeah, we're open-minded to that too. Then they were asked, well, are you open-minded about the Bible? And most of them said no. College age. Too smart to repent. For them, now is not the day of salvation, they say. Now is not the accepted time. Well, they get out of school finally, and uh, they start thinking maybe about uh, a career, thinking about maybe even marriage, maybe about uh, a home, buying a house, and all those things. Wow, that's a lot to do, isn't it? Got to start a career, I'm really busy in that. Got to think about marriage, thinking about a uh, home, setting up home and all that stuff. <sighs> I'm too busy. Too busy to give attention now to Jesus Christ. I got too many things going on. So we'll put it off till later when I'm successful, when I'm older and uh, have more time. Then I'll start thinking about God. And then come the children. And you think you were busy before you had children. Wait till you have children. They wear you out. I got to sleep in on Sunday morning. It's 
only morning I can sleep in, you know, I got these kids, they're just, they just tire me out. I'm too tired to think about repentance now, think about believing and repentance. But little spare time I have, I just want to sleep in, or I want to watch TV or relax or something. Wait until the children are grown. Then I'll respond to the word of God. For those parents with children, now is not the accepted time. Now is not the day of salvation. It'll come later. Well, finally the children grow up and are gone. Now you're at the height of your career. You have some real responsibilities in your job. But worse yet, all these years as they pass, you're getting more set in your ways. Your thinking becomes solidified. All the things you've heard and learned all your life, you're forming your philosophy of life. It's becoming hardened in you. And you have job worries, you have responsibilities, you have community standing. I've got all these people that know me in the community. If I were to talk about repenting of my sins and believing in Jesus Christ as God and Savior, yeah, all my friends and acquaintances and people at work, they think I was a fanatic. Can't do that. Wait until I retire and get, get out of the job. For them, now is not the accepted time. Now is not the day of salvation. So long comes retirement. Surely now will be the accepted time, the day of salvation. Oh, no. Retirement, I've got that bucket list. All those things I wanted to do when I was working couldn't do. Now I want to travel. Now I want to get that boat or that motorcycle or whatever. And not only that, I'm starting to get some health problems. I got all these things going on. I, I don't have time to repent of my sins and think about Jesus and the Bible. I'll wait until I'm close to dying. So-called deathbed conversions. People who are imminently facing death, they say, now tell me about Jesus. Tell me about my sins. Tell me about repentance. Now is the day of salvation. Can't put it off much longer, can you? A minister once did a study. He tracked the lives of 2,000 people that he had spoken to in nursing homes and hospitals who said that they repented of their sins and trusted in Jesus as their Savior at the end of their life. They thought it was the end of their life anyway. They thought they were dying. But who had really not died? They'd gotten out of the hospital. They'd recovered. And lo and behold, of those 2,000 people that he had followed and studied, only two went on to true faith, repentance, and faith in Christ. When they found out they weren't going to die right away, they forgot all about their so-called conversion. What's the lesson in this? Satan deceives you into thinking, put it off. You can do it later. But God says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Regardless of your age, infants, baptism, preschoolers, remember the words of Jesus, let the little children come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Two of the great Christians of the last three or four hundred years, his name 
Zinzendorf, the other was a Moravian man. Both of them came to faith at the age of four. Zinzendorf wrote this at the age of four. Dear Savior, do thou be mine, and I will be thine. Four years old wrote that. He didn't put it off. For him, now is the accepted time. Here's a prayer written by a parent of a preschooler. I wash the dirt from little feet. And as I wash, I pray, Lord, keep them ever pure and true to walk the narrow way. I wash the dirt from little hands. And earnestly I ask, Lord, may they ever yielded be to do the Savior's tasks. I wash the dirt from little knees and pray, Lord, may they be the place where victories are won and orders sought from thee. I scrub the clothes that soil so soon and pray, Lord, may her dress throughout eternal ages be thy robe of righteousness. Her hands and feet, these I can wash. I trust her heart to thee. For preschoolers, now is the day of salvation. And students, when you get into school, what's molding their minds? What's molding their, their thoughts and their, their beliefs and their philosophy of life? Atheistic government schools that teach the Bible is full of lies? Facebook? Peer pressure? Movies? Television, that's going to mold their minds. Behold, for students, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation to repent of your sin. Believe in Jesus as your Savior. The Internet is molding minds, young minds, every day, hour by hour. What are they hearing of God, of his word, the Bible? Now is the time for young people in school to immerse themselves in God's word. To let God mold their souls and their minds and their hearts. The great Christian preacher Charles Spurgeon said he came to faith at the age of 12. The great uh, preacher who wrote his great Bible commentary, Matthew Henry, came to faith at the age of 11. The early Christian era uh, church father, Polycarp, came to faith at the age of 9. For students, behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And marriage? Marry a person who has repented and come to faith in Jesus. Marry the right person. And your marriage is going to turn out a whole lot better. Statistics prove this. Far less divorce. Far less broken homes. Where both the father and mother, the husband and the wife, have repented of their sins and trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and who put Jesus Christ at the center of their home. Whatever stage in life you're at, receive not the grace of God in vain. Behold, now is the accepted time. One more thing. The book of Genesis, uh, we read about Abraham and his descendants. And then in Exodus, we find them 
in slavery in Egypt. They've multiplied to two and a half million in population, but they're slaves. But God delivers them by sending Moses to them and putting ten plagues upon Egypt. Now, one of these plagues that God put upon Egypt was the plague of frogs. And God sent frogs to Egypt in great numbers. You couldn't hardly put your foot down without stepping on a frog. There were frogs in Pharaoh's palace, frogs in his sitting room, frogs in his bed. He'd cut open a, a loaf of bread, there'd be a frog in it. Finally, he couldn't take it anymore. He called in Moses and he said, Moses, get rid of these frogs. Call upon your God to get rid of these frogs. And Moses said to Pharaoh, all right, when would you have God take these frogs away? And Pharaoh said, tomorrow. Isn't that surprising? I would have said, now, now, the sooner the better. See, a lot of people are like Pharaoh. When God comes to them with his word of repentance, word of law, and then his word of gospel and forgiveness in Christ Jesus, and says, do you believe? Do you repent? They're like Pharaoh, and they say, tomorrow. They should say, now, now. Receive not the grace of God in vain. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Amen. I may the peace of God, which surpasses all of man's understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.